So Breaking Bad was a TV show that came out in the late 2000s. And the show takes place in New Mexico and follows two characters, chemistry teacher Walter White and his student Jesse Pinkman, and their slow descent into the meth business and criminal world. I know, weird to give a sermon on this, but hear me out. It all ties in. One reason this show was so popular was because of the father and son type of relationship between Walter and Jesse. Throughout the series, Jesse tries to leave, but Walter, needing him, abuses that father-like power and keeps him in there. There's one part about halfway through the series where Jesse gets put into the hospital because he's in the meth world, and he wants out. He's done. He tells Walter when he visits, you don't respect me, you don't care about me, you don't even think I'm as good as you. Walter just tells Jesse, you are as good as me, abusing that father figure, and the next episode, they're partners again. Now, the reason I bring this up is to show the influence of a role model. You know, if, imagine if Walter was a better person in the show. Yes, it would have been about two episodes, but Jesse would have had a better life. Now, it might be hard to get the point across, considering this is a fictional television show, but we can look at our own lives as an example. I can say with confidence that every person in this room has at least one personality trait that was copied off of someone else. And that's not a bad thing. Imitation is just a part of life. Children imitate their parents to establish their personality, and then they follow their peers to add on to it. This theme of imitation can be found in Paul's letter to Thessalonica. I'm going to be honest. First time I've ever heard of Thessalonians was about two weeks ago when I found out I was doing a sermon on it. So, not wanting to be unprepared, and mainly because Andrew suggested it, I did some uh, research. Here's a summary of what I learned. Paul and his two companions, Silas and Timothy, went across the part of the world that they had access to, with the objective of preaching the word of Jesus. While they faced adversity preaching in temples to Jewish people, the Gentiles wanted to listen to what Paul had to say. If I'm Paul in this situation, or in this scenario, I'm a little confused. Here I am, a Jewish leader, preaching that the Savior who was promised to us has already arrived. And yet the people who want to hear this message are the ones who are just now learning about it, not the ones in the synagogue. So here we have a dilemma. The Jewish people don't want to hear this message, while the Gentiles do, but don't really have a place to hear it. With this division between them, establishing a church was difficult. Enter the church Paul writes to in Thessalonians. Now this church seems to have figured out a solution, as the Jews and the Gentiles not only tolerate each other, they cooperate and seem to have a healthy relationship. With this achievement, Paul writes to them, congratulating, on this, congratulating them on this accomplishment and calling them imitators of the Lord. That's a pretty big compliment coming from Paul. And it's because of this, I believe Thessalonica created what Paul used as his guidelines for how the church should look. And I imagine that every church since this letter was written has somehow imitated this exact church, including ours. Now, I've been a member of Raleigh Court since I was born. And during this time, I participated in almost every program that was available, including Kids Kirk, Vacation Bible School, and many others leading to this youth group. In this time, I've seen how this church is an imitator of the Lord. As a child, I looked up to my adult chaperones every Wednesday during Kids Kirk. They not only volunteered their free time to help with elementary students, which I'm sure had its share of difficulties, they all seemed like they wanted to be there. Every adult was happy to show every child how much God loves them by giving them a place to learn about him and spend quality time with their church family that will watch them and help them grow. A few names come to mind. Linda Mays, Robin Agnette, Aaron Hutchinson, and Lee Sackett. Linda Mays was our music director, and she led a very fun program where kids got to sing for all of you and tell our story, or our message to you. Robin on yet, for lack of a better term, was her assistant, and she is still volunteering in God Alive to this day, which is the same program with a different name. As for Erin Hutchinson, she played piano for us, and she followed some of the Kids Kirk graduates to this youth group, where she leads high school girls, small group, and chaperones on various trips, including Montreat. Lee Sackett, 
There was never a day at Kidskirk where Lee Sackett did not have the biggest smile on her face. And every time, and I'm sure there were annoying kids, myself included, she never yelled at us. And if she did, I don't remember any of it. I just remember the good with her. And these people and everyone else has influenced me so much throughout my years, and I know it's one of the main reasons I continue to grow in my faith. It's so much so that in my senior year, I decided to volunteer my free time to give back to this community and hopefully influencing those God Alive students to feel the same appreciation that I felt. Maybe one day they'll choose to imitate me and give back as well. So much like Paul wrote to Thessalonica, think of this as my letter to you, Raleigh Court. I will always thank God that I was given this church family to grow up in. I thank everyone who has helped me in my faith, and I plan to take every lesson that I learned here to continue to imitate our Lord. Leadership inspired by Christ means serving others against adversity. Even the most sophisticated psychologists and people analysis have yet to make leadership development more science than art. You can look at sports, education, and especially now, political ads. Recently, I have seen so many Mike Bloomberg for president ads, I feel like I'm friends with the guy. <laughs> the ad is filled with all kinds of campaign slogans saying how he was successful as a mayor. However, after reading over today's passage, one quote that stuck out to me from the ads was that Bloomberg is a natural born leader. I will take the time now to tell you that this is not some campaign for Mike Bloomberg but his barrage of advertisements certainly came at a good time for my sermon preparations. <laughs> Can someone really be a natural born leader or is it learned by watching others lead by example? There had to be a mentor before him that showed him how to be a leader. This leads me to my question, how can one lead by example? The Harvard Business Review did a study on people in positions of power and how they lead by example. One Silicon Valley CEO said that he had attended his company's diversity training program, saying, I want everyone to know that I take this stuff seriously. He didn't just want to learn about his company's diversity, he wanted to show people how important it was by going to it himself, and not just requiring it for his employees and finding something else to do that day. Another CEO pointed out that he had promoted a college dropout to a management position over someone with an MBA because he wanted his employees to value performance more than credentials. He is leading by example by not just saying credentials matter, but actually following through with his statement by promoting the less educated employee. These brief examples show that these leaders weren't just saying stuff that people wanted to hear. They actively, and not just verbally, communicate values the leader believes important. The key point in that sentence is not just verbally. In my opinion, it's easier to tell someone how they should act than physically show them. We find it much easier to say what we think and then hide from the repercussions, but actually putting ourselves in a position that may not be comfortable is part of leading by example. For instance, how many times have you followed someone you don't even know through the wrong door or into the wrong line? Probably everybody. Wherever this has happened, there was likely proper signage, but the action taken by someone else took priority over any signs. And since people were going in one way, you didn't want to be the one to stand out and potentially go in the wrong way. Humans act very similarly to sheep because we don't like to risk embarrassment or our social status by standing out. We are even referred to as sheep by Jesus while he is our shepherd. This m isn't meant to be insulting, but it's only comparing our innate nature to follow to sheep's natural instinct to stay in their herd. This is why becoming the leader has proven to be difficult. In Thessalonians, Paul has established a church in Thessalonica. However, Paul doesn't stay forever, as his mission is to travel as much as possible to start new churches. He relies on the word of God to lead these people and allow them to spread the word to new places. In his letter to the Thessalonians, 
Paul is praising them for their work and their bravery for working to spread the word of the church. However, he mentions that this word is not just being spread verbally. People are finding out about this church through the actions of its members. Our actions speak louder than words. Everyone has probably heard the saying, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? This idea of, of not just using words, but our actions is what the Thessalonians embodied in their time. Paul was very far away when he wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, which means the people of this church had not only spread the word of this church by what they said, but by how they treated others. This created such a big reputation that Paul had heard about it from hundreds of miles away. Christianity is not the same as it is today where we can safely gather without the same worry of pe people of Thessalonica. There also wasn't a screen to hide behind. These people lead with their actions and not their words. This may not have even been by choice, but because of the adversity and persecution they faced, they found that the safest and most effective way to spread the word of God was through their actions. And they found that after hearing back from Paul that their actions had in fact spoken louder than their words. This adversity necessarily isn't a bad thing. When our faith is challenged, it allows us a chance to consider our relationship with God. And based on the fact that you are all here today, you have also been able to make it through that same adversity. We have multiple options during adversity. Some choose to give up on their faith and God. But for others, the chance to reconsider our relationship with God can make our bond even stronger than it was before. Hearing this, I want to challenge you to not just read the word, but act upon it and create your own example to spread the word of God, much like the Thessalonians did 2,000 years ago. Amen. Sam Burns was born on October 23, 1996, in Foxborough, Massachusetts. Just before his second birthday, doctors diagnosed him with a rare genetic disorder called progeria. Progeria causes the body to age extremely rapidly. Symptoms are comparable to aging at a rate eight to 10 times faster than normal. This means that an eight-year-old with progeria looks like an 80-year-old. There are only 161 known cases of progeria in the world. Most children diagnosed with the disorder do not live past the age of 13. Simply put, progeria is caused by mutations that, weakly, that weaken the cellular nucleus structure, which makes normal cell reproduction problematic. Mental development, however, is not adversely affected. No treatment has yet been proven effective in curing progeria. In 2013, when Sam Burns was 17 years old, he presented a TED Talk in which he explained his philosophy for a happy life. First, Sam emphasizes the importance of being okay with what you ultimately can't do, because there's so much that you can do. In this segment of his talk, he describes his dream of playing snare drum in his high school's marching band. His band director, out of consideration for his condition, assigned Sam to the sideline percussion section, where he played instruments including bongos, timpani, and timbales. But Sam's dream was to be in the marching band, playing on the field with his peers, not just standing on the sidelines. This seemed like an impossible dream, though, because the snare drum and the harness needed to carry it weighed a combined 40 pounds. For reference, at the age of 17, my age, Sam only weighed 50 pounds. It seemed like all hope was lost, but Sam was not ready to give up. He met personally with an engineer and he helped to design a harness and a drum that were light enough to carry, weighing only six combined pounds. With his custom snare, he marched with his friends and performed the theme song from Spider-Man. Videos of Sam playing during the halftime show reveals him marching alongside his peers, hitting every accent of his note, of his music, with his face lit up by a beautiful smile. Sam did not spend his time focusing on what he could not do because of his condition. 
His hope made him persevere and realize what he could do, even with obstacles in his path. The second aspect of Sam's philosophy is to surround yourself with people who you want to be around. By this, I don't think that Sam necessarily means to surround yourself with those who make you happy. He means to be around those who challenge you and who want to help you become a better person. Since I was baptized by Tupper Garden in 2002, I've grown up in this church. As I've attended events here over the past 17 years, I've always felt surrounded by the people that I want to be like. So much of my identity, who I am and how I act, has been influenced by my fellow church members. When I look around the sanctuary this morning, I see the personal connections that I have made over the years, and I remember some of those who aren't here anymore. I see many of my current mentors, Ellen Austin, Claire Arnold, and Aaron Hutchinson, who have shown me ways to love others and the power of faith and prayer. And I remember others like Betty Merritt, who not only gave me my Bible in the second grade, but showed the Christian values by the ways that she served others. I see the people who challenge me to be the best version of myself and my best friends who truly are a family for me. You have changed my life, and I am forever thankful. Sam's philosophies of hopeful endurance and the transformative influence of others reminds me of how this congregation and my personal faith encourage the same principles. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians carries a very similar message. The suffering of the Thessalonians might have been very different from Sam's, but Paul encourages the same principles of optimism and of hope. Most importantly, the Thessalonians didn't just hear that message. They welcomed it, and they sustained the message of Christ, which Paul had brought them. They put it into action. Both Sam Burns and the Thessalonians used hope as a driving force for perseverance in the midst of hardship. They pushed through their obstacles. In our lives, we all face challenges of our own. Life presents us with quick fixes and alleged solutions that we're told will fix all of the problems that we face. Life makes it easy to place our hope in these quick fixes, causing us to forget that our ultimate hope should be placed in God. For example, as a teenager, we're told that social pressures of fitting into popular friend groups or impressing others for the sake of maintaining a good reputation should be a higher priority than embodying our faith. Later in life, financial burdens and overwhelming schedules can take the focus away from living in the way which God calls us. When we let these idols take our focus away from God, we're forgetting Paul's message of perseverance inspired by hope. Recentering our focus on God and directing our perspective to more hope-provoking things in life can be the direct result of engagement and commitment to Christian communities. These might include a weekly youth group, a Bible study, a Sunday school class, fellowship dinners, or just having a meal and playing board games with friends. Reminding us of hope and building the perseverance to work through it might just be one of the most important things that church does. No matter what you are going through, there is hope. This is a message that we must commit to sharing with each other. As its biblical basis reminds us, and as Sam Burns so eloquently stated, it may well be the secret to a truly meaningful and happy life. Amen.